Rabbi Ryan Dalkin, all the various permutations of your many, um, of all that you bring to our campus. Um, so this is the last talk in our series for the year. Um, so, and it's wonderful to be able to close it out with, um, with your talk today. So, um, Ryan Dalkin holds a PhD in Midrash and Scriptural Interpretation from the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, where he also received rabbinic ordination prior to receiving the PhD. He's a scholar of rabbinic literature with a focus on the history of biblical exegesis and is uh, reworking an earlier project, and this is what we'll be hearing today, which is now his, his book manuscript in progress um, on rabbinic approaches to the Adam and Eve narrative in Genesis. So that is the topic of today's um, talk, but he has also broader interests in rabbinic anthropology, communal and interpersonal ethics, and a number of other things as well. He was, before coming here, um, held the position of visiting assistant professor at uh, Franklin and Marshall College, teaching wonderful courses, and we're certainly looking forward to having um, Ryan, who has also just joined the faculty of the Center for Jewish Studies, to having him also um, be teaching for us in the coming year or so. Um, he has also taught at the Jewish Theological Seminary at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in Philadelphia, and also at Washington University in St. Louis, among other places. So his talk today is entitled, Who's to Blame, Eve or Adam? Shifting Perspectives on Culpability in Genesis 3. So welcome. This is now your official welcome to the Thank University you. of Minnesota. Thank you. I'm really excited to be back uh, in teaching in, in the university. So thank you for having me, Leslie. Um, I will we'll walk you, hopefully walk you through a, a text that's near and dear to my, uh, my heart of both the Rabbi Natan, uh, I'll say a little bit more about what that text is, um, and, uh, and, and use that as an opportunity to, to introduce you to the methodologies that sort of animate my work, which is, uh, and I'll say more about this, um, a combination of subject matter, um, but putting it in a tradition's history context to see how, um, how uh, themes develop over time in rabbinic literature. So, but I want to tell you, begin a little bit by telling you a little bit about the impetus of this whole project that I've been working on for the better part of, I don't know, I'm now in my second decade, I think, of this project. Um, it all started for me, actually I didn't know when it started, but it started for me in 1997 when I visited Jerusalem for the first time, and I went into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre which I think is a great place to start any project on rabbinic literature. And um, one of the things that I f found under cavalry, uh, the, the traditional site of Jesus' crucifixion, is the shrine of Adam, or the tomb of Adam. And I was really intrigued by this juxtaposition of Adam situated under the cross of Golgotha. Um, and I didn't really learn, know too much about it, that visit, that was uh, uh, about a year before I started rabbinical school. And then about four years later, I was studying a rabbinic text called Perkei Rabbi Eliezer, which is a 8th or 9th century rewritten biblical text, in, uh, uh, a rabbinic rewriting of the Bible, uh, working through uh, Midrash and scripture. We'll talk, again, talk a little bit more about that. And I came across a tradition that the place that that Abraham built the altar when he went to sacrifice Isaac was uh, the same uh, the same altar that Adam had built, and then Adam and that altar got destroyed. Noah rebuilt it, and then Abraham rebuilt it, and that became the site of the temple. And so I was really interested in this sort of notion of the way that the sacrifices happened uh, were, were taking place are the same material substance that, out of which humanity was created. And the larger myth, I think, in that is that whenever Israel is atoning for sin on the altar, there's a there's a atoning for all of humanity. And because of that equation of the substance, Adam's material was taken, Adama, from the earth. That place was the earth and altar. So I raised my hand uh, in my class with my uh, soon-to-be advisor, Bert Pazotsky, and I said, this reminds me, in a way, of that thing that I saw at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And he uh, pointed out to me that there is a, biblical, there's a, a 
a rewritten Christian text called the Syriac Cave of Treasures, where this theme comes up. And the idea in the Syriac Cave of Treasures is that as soon as Jesus was speared in the side and blood and, and water spilled out from him, um, that had a cleansing um, effect on Adam, who was buried under the cross. So Jesus' death then atones for Adam, and there's a whole tradition about this. So I became very interested in um, doing some comparative study about um, these, these sort of traditions that emerge in both Christianity and in Judaism. When I did a lot of reading, I realized that um, there's been a lot of work, comparative work, on Jewish and Christian sources of Adam and Eve. It's a really popular topic, but in, in the scholarly uh, literature, um, because uh, I would argue the story of Adam and Eve is so central to Christian theology, um, most of the work has done, been done by Christian scholars or st scholars of Christianity that have been interested in sort of, re of understanding the rabbinic material as a way of kind of backgrounding uh, Christian thought and Christian development, Christian traditions. Um, and that there's been a lot of work on Adam and Eve, but sort of compartmentalized either studies of Eve or notions of sin, but there wasn't really any body of work that tried to kind of fully understand what are the contours of the, uh, the rabbinic interpretation of, of Adam and Eve. Like, even a very simple question, which is, is Adam and Eve, the story of Adam and Eve, central to you know, rabbinic Judaism? Um, one would make the case uh, that the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be much more sort of relevant <coughs> to uh, what would become J Jewish theology, rabbinic theology, than the early stories in Genesis. So that sort of piqued my interest. Um, and I set about to try to um, collate all of the traditions that I could find on Adam and Eve in rabbinic literature and decided that one dissertation was enough for a doctorate. Um, and uh, what, what my study found is that over time, rabbinic literature kind of hones in on sort of motifs. And um, those motifs uh, then find their way throughout the, the different corpora of rabbinic literature. So for example, uh, the first motif that I think is crucial in the story of Adam and Eve from a rabbinic perspective, I want, is um, when God says, let us create a human being in our image, the rabbis want to know, well, who is this us? To whom is God speaking? And that, I, that question becomes a motif that the rabbis try to answer over and over and over again. They come up with various uh, interlocutors for God, uh, none of, uh, they mostly settle on the angels. That's a conversation between God and the angels about whether or not creating hum humanity is a good idea. The angels usually argue that it's a bad idea. God has to then get around the angels' objections. And this motif appears in early rabbinic literature. It appears in the Talmud and then in various post-Talmudic sources. So the motif that I'm going to uh, sort of bring you today is this motif of who's to blame, Adam or Eve. Um, but in order to do that, I want to tell you a little bit more about sort of the methodology I use to, um, to try to answer this question. So the first one is that um, if you've ever studied rabbinic texts, um, even in translation, you can kind of, you could read them and understand the words and still just completely not get what the point is. Because it's a very terse, language is often really dependent on like a, a deep understanding of Hebrew and puns that are being made. It's real, I think it's a really hard literature to enter into without uh, someone to sort of curate your ride along the way until you have enough under your belt to kind of get what's going on. So the, the literature itself is a really challenging uh, body to just sort of understand the basics. And then there's a second complication, which is that um, really up until, I'd say like the medieval period, you don't really have Jewish authors, right? We, um, we have the book, we have Maimonides who wrote Guide for the Plex, for the Perplex. We know who Maimonides is, we know when he lived, 
It's a unitary work written by one author. But most of classical rabbinic literature is, is not really traceable to an individual author. They, uh, the, the texts come in great uh, rabbinic anthologies. The first major rabbinic anthology, the Mishnah, um, thought to be um, uh, put together under the auspices of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, um, he's not really the author. Um, so uh, this holds true for all of the early major rabbinic corpus, uh, corpora. So the Talmud, the collections of uh, Midrashim on individual biblical books, uh, Genesis Rabbah, for example, they're all anthological in some sense. But I don't think that they're, you know, uh, just sort of put together of this rabbi said this and this rabbi said that, but there's often a editorial framework that the, that the author, that the authorship, and I'm using Jacob Neusner's term, I'm, I mostly follow Jacob Neusner on this, that um, there are certain redactional or editorial um, uh, um, patterns that emerge in each of these works. So it's really important not only to understand a basic text, a, rabbinic, a, a basic source on Adam and Eve, but also to kind of understand how that fits in the larger complex of texts in which the work is um, uh, anthologized. So uh, another example of this is that most of the early stuff on uh, Adam and Eve appear in this text called Genesis Rabbah, which is a fifth century redacted text, redacted in, uh, in Roman and Byzantine Palestine. And that's going to be different than the Babylonian Talmud, which is redacted a couple hundred years later in Sasanian Babylonia. So then not only do you have the same text, but they're uh, written by um, authors that think of themselves as rabbis, but they also exist in different social and political contexts. So, um, so that idea of trying to understand a text within context, um, redaction criticism is a major motivation, uh, a major way that I think about these texts. Once I have you know, sort of isolated texts and sort of understand them in the context in which they appear, either in a Midrashic collection or in the Talmud, um, I then like to see how those texts uh, uh, permutate through the rabbinic corpora. Uh, so that's putting traditions into sort of a tradition's history. Um, so when one anthology has Adam, Eve to blame, but another one has Adam to blame, I kind of, that's, that for me is like a big deal. Like, how did that happen? And that's what I want to sort of show, walk you through today, is looking at a text, um, a, a, a text in which the, the, the trajectory of the motif changes from uh, blaming on Eve to blaming on, uh, to shifting the blame to Adam. So I'm going to kind of walk you through this methodology and use Genesis 3, 1 through 6 as a case study. So we're going to look at the biblical text. Um, I'm going to focus on a particular text of Vot de Rabbi Natan B, which is a post-Talmudic uh, rabbinic retelling of um, both uh, the great compendium of Jewish ethical sayings, the Perkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, as well as uh, retellings of the biblical texts. And then once we've kind of walked through the of Vot de Rabbi Natan, retelling of this chat, this this episode in the story of Adam and Eve, we will uh, look at some traditions that are antecedent that, that, that precede this text uh, in biblical, post biblical, and in rabbinic texts to show that the Vot de Rabbi Natan pretty much holds uh, a, a pretty uh, holds the line that Eve is to blame. And then we'll see how that changes in a vote, a vote to Rabbi Nathan A, and then we'll kind of ask well, why, or what are the implications of that. So that's the, that's the, that's the roadmap. Uh, but so before I begin that, are there any like comments or questions? Kind of throw a lot at you? All right, so let's, um, so a vote to Rabbi Nathan uh, is a commentary on Mishnah Perkei Avot, uh, also known in English as Ethics of the Fathers. It is a post-Talmudic work, 
probably dating sometime after the seventh century of the Common Era, as late as maybe the eighth or ninth century. Uh, in rabbinic time, it would be a Gaonic text. Um, it's an interesting text because there are two recensions, and I think that's what makes it really interesting. So what's the difference between, what is a recension? Of a, uh, most early rabbinic texts, we only have one version, like the Mishnah. We have one version of the Mishnah. There might be differences in manuscripts, but they're slight, relatively speaking. Um, and that's true of the Talmud. We have different manuscripts, and... and but we really only have one Babylonian Talmud. As we start moving further on into Jewish literature, um, we have texts that are similar enough that, um, that they cohere, and we can call them a text, but they come in different recensions, different versions. I was just watching this uh, new Stars show called Counterpart. Is anybody here? If you haven't seen it, it's kind of, it's a, I, I think it's pretty interesting. There's, the premise is, is that at some point, like in the 70s, there was a rupture, and there, there's now like two universes. And they're similar but different. And anyway, they, the characters go back and forth. So I think like that's sort of a good way of illustrating like this phenomenon of a recension. At some point, Avodah Rabbi Natan had an early period, and then it branched out. And those, and those branches developed into um, enough of a difference that it's worth analyzing them separately. And that's what we're going to be doing. The um, version B, um, it just happened, to, that's what Solomon Schechter decided to name. This one is actually probably earlier, so that could be confusing. So we're going to do version B first and then version A. Okay. So let's begin with the biblical texts uh, that these, um, that the, the retelling flows from. So uh, the ground text for our subject is Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, where God relays the prohibition against eating from the tree of good and bad or good and evil to Adam. Eve has not been created yet. It's sort of important to, to note. So these are, these are my translations. The Lord God commanded the human, saying, from every tree of the garden you may surely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day of your eating from it you shall surely die. Um, pretty straightforward. Let's see, though, the commandment comes up again in the conversation between the serpent and Eve, and Adam is not in the scene. And this is uh, how, uh, how, the, the, how the, story, the story goes. The serpent said to the woman, Has God said you shall not eat from every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the fruit of the tree of the garden, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Let's see if I got this right in my PowerPoint. Yep. Um, so the... The key here is that Eve adds something to the original prohibition. What does Eve add? Touching it. The prohibition against touching it. Now, normally in rabbinic thought, adding something to the commandment is not a bad thing. If it, if it will uh, keep you from violating the commandment itself. So the class, this is called siyad la Torah a fence around the Torah. The classic example of this is that you're supposed to light the Shabbat candles 18 minutes before sunset, so you shouldn't ever have you know, come close to lighting the candles after the sun has set and therefore violate the Shabbat prohibition against lighting fire. Um, and, and you could argue that much of rabbinic practice is based on this idea of of, of surrounding the essential mitzvot with other guards so you will never violate those, you know, those principles. Um, usually this is a good thing in rabbinic literature, but in this story, uh, this is going to be, uh, we'll see, this is going to be a problem. This is going to be the problem. Okay, so, so the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the tree of the garden, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of, of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. 
The serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die, for God knows that on the day of your eating from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a desire to the eyes, and the tree was alluring to ponder. And she took from its fruit, and she ate, and she also gave to her man with her, and he ate. Um, with those, with this text ringing in your ears, hopefully, <coughs> we'll see how the rabbi, how the rabbis retell it now. Okay, so the rabbinic retelling in um, uh, about to Rabbi Natan A. In your handout, that's going to be the text that is on the left side and left column. Okay, so the 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 way that Avot Rabbi Natan frames the story in its retelling is this um, um, question of creating a siad, and the Hebrew there you see the word siad, it's uh, in the first line there. From where is it derived that Adam made offense for his words? Since the Blessed Holy One said to him, "Eat from every tree of the garden, but from the tree of knowledge do not eat." Here. From Eve's words, we derive that Adam fenced her in. Again, here's this like example of how ter- terse the rabbinic teaching is. So you kind of have to add some words here to make sense of it. That I think what the midrash is trying <coughs> to say here is that when Adam told Eve about the prohibition, Adam added this extra layer of a uh, prohibition against touching it, and. Uh, and that's how Eve understood the prohibition. So here, Adam is engaging in that rabbinic practice of siyag la Torah. And so the, one, of the, one of the premises also of rabbinic retelling of, um, of biblical narratives is to rabbinize all of the biblical characters. So here, Adam is behaving like a rabbi. OK, so the serpent uses this. Um, as, as his pl- he, he creates a plan to attack the couple. And he uses the, these words as the way to get to them. So here the serpent debated with himself and said, if I go to Adam and speak to him, I know that he will not listen to me. Rather, I shall go to Eve, since I know that women listen to any man. Right? That's not in the biblical text. Right? So now we're seeing the rabbis weave in Right, midrash or commentary into their telling. Um, he went and said to her, also has God said, do not eat from any tree of the garden? She said to him, yes, from the fruit of the tree of the garden you may eat, but from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, God has said, do not eat from it lest, uh, lest you die, uh, do not eat from it, nor touch it lest you die. I always have to have one typo in a something, or it doesn't count as a Ryan Dulkin PowerPoint. When the serpent uh, heard Eve's words, he found an opening in which to enter. He went and took from its tree, from the tree and ate it. <clears throat> um, so you can hear the biblical background, right? You can hear the story, but you also can see that the rabbis are weaving in things that don't appear in the biblical text, right? The serpent's internal conversation, um, the fact that the serpent ate from the tree, that doesn't appear in the biblical text. Um, there's also going to be a, an element of this retelling that there are going to be like paradoxes or there are going to be things that don't make a lot of sense. I don't think this is the most smooth retelling of the story. Perke Rabbi, I mean, Avot Rabbi Natan version A has a much smoother uh, retelling. But one of the key aspects of this, is just as a document, is that we can see the midrash, the interpretation, is being seamlessly woven into the biblical text. There's no like, oh, Here's the text, and then the and then Rabbi so and so interprets it for us, right? There, this is part of something that happens <coughs> after the Talmud, where the rabbis kind of seamlessly weave in their um, their midrashim. Okay, so the serpent violates the fence, right? He says he went and said to her, "Behold, I touched it, and I did not die. Also, if you touch it, you will not die." He pushed her, and she touched it, and did not die. Right? So, so the serpent has like nudged Eve into the tree. She's touched it. She's violated the prohibition. She hasn't died. So now the serpent proves his point. Know yourself that this is only a bad intent. Like God is trying to keep the tree from you. 
when you eat from it, what he is able to do to create a world, also you will be able to create a world. What he is able to do to take and restore life, also you will be able to take and to restore life. Since it is said, for God knows on the day of your eating from it. So apparently the argument that the serpent is making here is that the reason that God doesn't want them to eat from the tree of good and evil is that they will become, they will become deified. They will become like God. They will have these uh, God, godly powers. And since Eve has been pushed into the tree and she hasn't died, she now questions all of her assumptions. Now we get three versions of how Eve reacts after this moment. So the first version is, there are those who say when Eve ate from the tree, she saw herself as if she were uninjured and said, all of those very words that my master Adam commanded me are lies. Right? So now it's sort of Adam's fault that, uh, that um, Eve has uh, you know, been seduced by the serpent because Adam has been proved false. And there's a little aside here we learned that um, Rabbi, that Adam called Eve Rabbi, my master, right? So there's that rabbinization of Adam, but there's also that sort of inherent um, uh, uh, hierarchy built into uh, gender hierarchy. That's the first reaction. The second version is, and there are those who say that when Eve ate from the fruit of the tree, she saw the angel of death coming to her. She said, I seem as if I am being taken away from the world, and afterwards... God will create another woman for Adam in my stead. What shall I do? I shall cause him to eat with me. As it is said, she took from its fruit and she ate, and she gave also to her man with her, and he ate. So in version two, the impetus for Eve giving Adam the fruit is you know, she's afraid that she's going to die now and that God will create another wife for her, uh, for Adam. And then the third version uh, and there are those who say when Adam ate from the fruit of the tree, his eyes began to open upon, uh, you know, I, you know what? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Adam ate from the, tr- the fruit of the tree, his eyes began to open upon him, and his teeth in his mouth were blunted. He said to Eve, Eve, what is it that you fed me? From the tree that I commanded you not to eat from, did you, uh, not to eat from, did you eat and feed to me? For behold, my eyes are opened upon me, and the teeth in my mouth are blunted. He said to her, as my teeth were blunted, similarly the teeth of all creatures shall be blunted. So Adam is in this third version, um, and blaming Eve for (coughs) having given him the fruit, and therefore uh, blaming Eve for all mortality that will come, not only for the first couple, but for mortality of all living creatures. So now Eve's sin is, is... is uh, exponentially greater, right? She's responsible for all mortality of all living creatures. Okay. All right, so um, before we move in, we're going to look at some earlier texts. Um, but what I think we have right now in, that, in, in our telling of Avodah Rebbe Natan B is that although, you know, Adam is a part of this story, that most of the focus has been on Eve. And that um, Eve um, it ultimately comes out of this uh, story as the one who brings death to Adam and to um, all of uh, creation. And Avot Rabinatan B is in good company with this uh, um, tradition. We can find this idea in biblical, post biblical, and um, and rabbinic text. So I want to give you a little. I'm going to give you a little sample of some of those to to underscore this idea that a vote Rabbi Natani is not really treading new ground here. Okay. So here in uh, in um, Proverbs we have the uh, image of the illicit woman whose uh, whose lips drip honey, but her bitter, her end is bitter as wormwood. And this sort of notion that death follows with the, the woman, right? Her feet go down to death, her steps grasp hold of Sheol. Um, so here, this word wisdom tradition, I don't think is necessarily commenting on the Garden of Eden story, but it's part of this uh, complex of wisdom literature that um, blames women for uh, uh, male downfall. 
we have another wisdom text, post-biblical. Um, this is the uh, uh, snippet from Ben Sira. From a woman, sin had its beginning, Arche. And that's also, an Arche is the beginning of uh, the Septuagint. So there's a sort of link to uh, the book of Genesis. And because of her, we all die. Um, we have a, this text from Philo on uh, Genesis and solution uh, questions and solutions in Genesis. Um, Philo asks, why does the serpent speak to the woman and not to the man? And Philo's answer, in order that they may be potentially mortal, he deceives by trickery and artfulness. And woman is more accustomed to be deceived than man. Uh, than man. For his judgment, like his body, is masculine and is capable of dissolving or destroying the designs of deception. But the judgment of woman is more feminine, and because of softness, she easily gives say and is taken in by plausible falsehoods which resemble the truth. This is probably, like, the mo like this would be, like, high misogyny. This is uh, in, in the tradition. Um, that there's something inherent in, the, in the, the, the gender of the woman that the serpent targets. And we saw that theme, that motif, in Avot de Rabbi Natan's retelling. Um, we have a couple texts from the New Testament. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by its cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Another text from Timothy. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. And finally, from rabbinic literature, uh, earlier than about the Rabbi Natan in Genesis Rabbah, on the verse Genesis 3.6, Rabbi Ibo said she squeezed grapes and gave to him. So... We just had uh, 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 Dr. Azania Dean who was here to talk a little bit about how the apple became an apple. The apple becomes an apple much later <laughs> in the medieval period in non-Jewish non sources. So the rabbi spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the fruit is. So here the answer is grapes basically got uh, Adam drunk. Right. Uh, rabbi Simai said, with calmness she came upon him and said to him, what do you think, that I shall die and another Eve will be created for you? There is nothing new under the sun. Or perhaps I shall die and you shall remain immortal. I did not create it to be a waste for settlement. I formed it. And so here Eve is like throwing in biblical verses, basically saying, um, you know, if I'm going to die, then that there will be uh, procreation, right? Our rabbi said she began, so that's one answer, and now we have another. Our rabbi said she began to proclaim against him with her voice, basically, she started nagging him to eat it. And also, the verse says, and also, this is an amplification. She caused the beasts and the animal and the birds to eat. Everything heated her and ate except one bird, and Chol is its name. Chol is uh, the Hebrew term for the phoenix, right? So. We hear a little, like, uh, the, the phoenix is the bird that will continually be uh, reborn. So only the whole didn't eat from the, fr the fruit of the tree. Um, so just by the very fact that we saw this sort of idea of the phoenix and uh, the <coughs> word that uh, Eve uses to describe immortality is a Greek-derived uh, word, uh, word ateles. Uh, we know that the rabbis are uh, part and parcel of the Greek culture around them. Um, we saw, we've seen some of these motifs weaved in to a vote to Rabbi Natan, I think in a way that is much like, <laughs> more felicitous as a, as a retelling than this. This is really kind of staccato. Rabbi X says this, Rabbi Y says that, and the other rabbi says this. Okay, but so far, just uh, the smattering, you know, I could have brought in, you know, a dozen or more examples from you know rabbinic and non-rabbinic literature. The dominant, I would say, the dominant tradition's history is that Eve is to blame for the sin, and it's only a matter of like how much to blame. And it goes from a lot to 
exponential, right? Okay, but we're going to look here at um, what happens in Avot de Rabi Natan A. So um, Avot de Rabi Natan A, in its retelling, begins the same way that Avot de Rabi Natan B begins, with this thing, with this question about the fence, um, and then. Um, Okay, so the, the beginning of the story in Avot to Rabbi Natan A is pretty much the same, but um, only, oh, there's only one reaction of Eve's in this retelling, which is, what did Eve say to herself? All of these things that my master commanded me from the beginning were lies. That's after she's been you know, pushed into the tree. And the only reaction she has is, like, Adam lied to me, right? So I would say that already, you know, there's kind of a sense here that Adam is really kind of the focus here, right? It's Adam's misrepresentation of the prohibition that is crucial. And the absence of the other two uh, reactions that Eve has, the one about bringing death to the world, right? Eve becomes, like, less consequential, in this retelling. What's really interesting is then Avot Rabbi Natan brings us some parables after uh, retelling it to help us, the reader, understand the point of the story. So the first parable um, asks, well, what, is, what, was Adam, what was Adam like at this moment? And the parable set, goes on to say, to a certain man who married a proselyte, he sat and, adjur and adjured her. Uh, I just hate my autocorrect, so I'm going to have to turn it back. He, uh, he said to her, My daughter, do not eat bread when your hands are impure, nor eat fruit which are not tithed, nor desecrate the Sabbath, nor violate oaths, nor go around with another man. Here, if you transgress, transgress one of them, behold, you die. So the, why is the wife a proselyte? Well, she didn't grow up right, with the meats of she doesn't, so she needs to be educated by her husband about what it is that Jews do. And here, the, the man gives a whole bunch of sort of ritual practices that one should, um, um, one should observe, the desecration of which leads to death. Then what did the man do? He arose and ate bread, which was in front of him while his hands were impure, and he ate fruit, which were not tithed, and he desecrated the Sabbath, and he violated oaths, and he reached for her with her, his hands. I think like he's kind of groping other women. What did the proselyte say in her heart? All the words that my husband adjured me with, adjured me with from the beginning are lies. Immediately she arose and transgressed all of them. So who's, who, who's, who's at fault in this parable? Clearly, her behavior is not you know, necessarily justified, but the impetus for her violating all of the commandments is the hypocrisy of the husband. Right? And remember, the, par the, parallel, the parable begins with, what is Adam like? Right? So the focus is on Adam's behavior. We have another parable. To what is Adam like? To one who had um, a wife in his house. What did that very man do? He went and brought a barrel, and he placed, it in, a, placed in it a number of dates and a number of nuts, and he trapped a scorpion, and he placed it upon the opening of the barrel, and he encircled it with a closely covered lid, and he placed it in the corner. So we're getting into Bluebeard territory, right? He said to her, my daughter, everything that I have in, in this house is handed over to you, uh, to your power, except this barrel, that you should not touch it at all. What did that woman do? When her husband went out to the market, she arose and opened the barrel and put out her hand into it, and the scorpion stung her. She went and fell upon the bed. Okay, so right now, before we get to the next part, who's who, who's who in the parable? This is not a rhetorical question. 
who, who, which characters align with which character in the parable? In the parable, do you think? Husband of God. Um, that's um, that's how it's that's how Avotar Rabbi Natan A is going to understand it. But I'm just saying, if you had it right now, without the without the end of the parable, I would say that to me. The woman is Eve. The woman in this act, acting is Eve, and the man is Adam. That's how I think. Like, like, like intuitively, I would understand the parable right now. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So she said to him, like the husband, the husband come back. My hand slipped upon the barrel, and the scorpion stung me, and behold, I'm dying. He said to her, Did I not say to you thus from the beginning? Everything that I have in this house is given into your hand except this barrel that you should not touch it at all. Immediately he was angry with her and sent her away. Divorced her. Okay, so right now, I'm again thinking in the parable that what makes the most sense to me is that Adam is the husband and the wife is Eve. But that's not how the, 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 the resolution to the parable is in about to Rabbi Natan. Thus, thus Adam was like at that moment when the Blessed Holy One said to him, From every tree of the garden you may surely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For on the day of your eating from it you, sh you will surely die. When he ate from it he was cast out to fulfill that which was said, A person shall not abide in glory. He is like the beasts who perish. So if you did not have any of the traditions that I was speaking about or had version B of Avota Rabbi Natan and you only were reading of, of, of Avota Rabbi Natan A, what I would argue here is that Adam is the focus of the retelling, right? Adam is the one who creates the prohibition, the extra prohibition, and the, the clarifying parable makes it clear to the reader that it's really Adam's fault, that God is the one who commands and Adam is the one who violated. And Eve doesn't really figure very prominently at all. She, she sort of leaves the stage. Okay, so, um, what, if I had a more responsive computer, okay. Um, I want to look at one other text. Uh, here's from the Quran, where the notion of culpability is shared. And unto man, O Adam, dwell thou and thy wife in the garden, and eat from whence ye will, but come not nigh this tree, lest ye become wrongdoers. Then Satan whispered to them uh, uh, that, uh, that he might manifest unto them that which was hidden from them of their shame. So, and, in, and, all, and almost all of the Quranic retellings, it's either to Adam or to both of them. So uh, the argument that I, um, oops, that's the end of it. The argument that I um, am, am making in my study here is uh, twofold. One is that um, Avota Rabbi Natan A is a very interesting test case because it seems to go against the grain not only of Avota Rabbi Natan B, but all of rabbinic literature and all of pre-rabbinic literature in sort of focusing on Adam. Um, one way to account for this is um, a sort of a wider understanding of about the Rabbi Natan A, which is that um, it's about venerating both biblical heroes and rabbinic heroes. And so Adam, um, even though he is the, uh, here the sinner, he's still kind of like the focus of the story. So in this way, it's not, it, it, you can argue well, it's less misogynistic than Avota Rabbi Natan B and the, his, and the uh, earlier history. Or you could argue it's just a different kind of misogyny, which is that he was sort of relegated off, off stage. Um, the other argument that I'm making that's a little bit more speculative is that Avota Rabbi Natan A um, takes a lot longer to, um, to solidify as a document, uh, well into the uh, Islamic era, and that perhaps the uh, influence of the Quran, where Adam is really the focus, uh, and Eve is not named Eve in the Quran. We don't find uh, Eve's name Hawa uh, in Islam unless we look at the Hadith literature. Um, that there's a certain way that Eve is displaced in the Quranic literature, 
and that um, this emphasis on the prophets and the heroes is subtly working its way uh, into rabbinic retellings of the story. Um, what I think is important about going through the tradition's history is that um, any one rabbinic t telling is not authoritative, but it is one sort of photographic snapshot of an, uh, of an idea or the motif traveling through time. And in order to really kind of capture what rabbinic literature or the rabbis think about any one topic requires this kind of deep uh, tracing of tradition through time to see how the rabbis um, continue to tell and retell a familiar story. So with that, I think I'll end and I'll take questions and comments. class comes in, so let's open it up. Thank you, Brian, for a wonderful, um, on, on, the, on the peeling of the onion and the layers. So. <coughs> sort of hedged her in in her prescribed actions, like limits limits her actions with respect to the tree. Um, and um, it's also, it's also, well, I'll call it that slide again, I'll look at the Hebrew and Um, I think it's here that Adam is limiting Eve's actions. But we learn it, what's interesting is here is we learn it from her words, um, because nowhere in the biblical text does it say uh, that Adam said, you shall not touch it. And so that's, the, that's one of the cruxes, like how did Eve add this question? And so... Um, the story is a way of trying to solve this very like basic, like exegetical question: Where did Eve learn this prohibition? Okay, just on this last part of what you're talking uh -huh. about, so with the man and the husband, you're saying that the man is Adam, the wife is Eve, and that's all. Okay, so what um, you know, if I had more time, we would go through like the uh, version B, which it's, I believe it is about Eve. Mm -hmm. Like what was Eve like at that very moment? But in version A, it's what was Adam like? What I was saying was if, if you didn't get to the end of the parable and all you had, all you had was the parable, right? And you had this woman, like you had this man who said, you know, everything in the garden is yours, um, but don't touch that, this bear. I mean, everything in the house is yours, but don't touch this bear. And, um, and he sort of booby trapped the barrel, right? That it would be, this is trying to explain what Adam was telling Eve about the garden. So the, the, the hedge is the scorpion, or like the fence. Well, I think the hedges don't touch the barrel. Like the, here, like it's, a, it's, a, it's, um, it's not a physical hedge or a physical fence, but it's more like a behavioral fence. Mm -hmm. So to like kind of illustrate it, um, in rabbinic... Shabbat Sabbath law, okay, this phone has no valid use on Shabbat. So, um, so I'm um, not allowed to handle the phone on Shabbat because it has no, that, that prohibition against me handling the phone is not, in terms of the rabbi's understanding of Sabbath law, not derived from the Torah. 
but it's an added stipulation the rabbis make because I should, you know, come and touch this phone and then, you know, check, check the ESPN or, you know, check, check the weather, right? So that prohibition is building a fence around the Torah. And so what I'd argue that um, what seems like the most logical reading of that particular parable is that this is Adam telling Eve, you know, instructing her about the behavior in the garden. But what I think, the, when we get to the solution to the parable, in Hebrew, the, uh, a parable in Hebrew is the mashal, and the solution is called the nimshal. When we get to the nimshal, the solution, it's just to me pretty counter, counterintuitive that it's Adam um, who's, who's doing all this, and, and that the husband is God. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to ask, it's like it's... The, the husband's God, as said, instead of Adam in that parable. That's how I'm right. talking to me. Yeah. Right. Do, but does that, is, does my argument seem, uh, make sense or seem plausible that if you didn't have the end, you probably, like, left, if I put just the parable without the solution in front of a hundred students and asked them, who's the character, I think most people would say the husband is Adam and the wife is Eve. Yeah. Well, but, without, the, without the end, I kind of said it more like, actually it was like God almost, but, but you said the end, it showed it's more as Adam. Remember you said you can, don't go, don't go to the barrel. Right. You can have anything you want in the house, it can go to your hand, but not that barrel. Right. And that's like what God said to like. Right, and so, so there yeah. is a plausible reading of right. the parable, yes. right, in that sort of sense, but the, but the language of don't touch the barrel. Right, yes. More aligns with the tradition about like the extra stipulation that Eve brings. Yeah, the added. Right. So I would say like the, the, the problem is that none of these retellings are, I mean, if I were like grading the writer of a vote to Rabbi Natan, you know, <laughs> I would, I would like have some like problems in the way that they, you know, convey the story and I would ask them for some revisions. Um, so there's nothing about it that is, there are things about it that are, that don't sit well. So there's a plausible way to read that parable as God and Adam, I'm just saying it's counterintuitive. And then because it's counterintuitive, I'm arguing that the, that makes the, the focus on Adam in a vote to Rabbi Natan A all the more clear and surprising. Thanks. So with that, um, the extra stipulation that you mentioned, that's added, that's added in the original story. Right. Like, right. Was there anyone who followed the thread that maybe when she was created, God was like, hey, for you, and actually, like, that God talked to her directly, <coughs> and, like, did anyone follow that thread? Or was um, it just the answer is probably yes. Um, I would have to sort of review. I mean, you know, there's, there are just hundreds of interpretations of this, you know, of this material. Um, uh, but I would sort of argue that the, the general trajectory up until like the early Middle Ages is to think of like Eve. Like the assumption is Eve blew it, and I got to figure out to tell you how that happened because the biblical narrative doesn't tell you how. But I think another like a larger a larger issue that sort of comes out of this question um, for me is. Um, if we if we see we see that the interpretation of these texts are unstable, that they seem sort of stable uh, in you know in time, uh, but already in the medieval period that sort of it's all Eve's fault breaks down. And if I were to you know think about well what if, you know how might we read the, this use this as a as a rupture in that tradition um, in the sort of contemporary thinking about the question um, that. The, you know, the rupture predates us a thousand years, and so we can continue that rupture. So, in the second version, uh -huh. um, if, the, if the husband is God, right, isn't haven't they added something to God's words themselves? Because in the Torah, in Genesis, it says, "Don't eat the fruit," but in the parable, it says, "Don't touch the barrel." Yes. So they're adding something to what God did, which seems to be a fairly central problem to why Eve ate the fruit, because he warned her not to touch it, 
which was not what preceded God's word, right. and, and led her astray. Right. I, I would say like that, you know, the, um, again, the, the rabbinic retellers are not um, super wedded to the facts, yeah. the textual facts, which I think is what makes this literature so interesting for me. Uh, but there's like a larger, there's kind of, I think kind of a larger question, which is um, the rabbis have God saying all kinds of things in the Midrash. The rabbis are not afraid of inhabiting the, 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 the godly voice um, to when they're explaining lots of things, like what did God say when he wrestled with the angels? They, they use and speak the words, of, the words of God. And I think it's, I just think it's like a, it's an obvious point, but sometimes like underappreciated. So I, I have a, I know the concept of yeah. defenses right. well established, uh-huh. but I, I have a concept, I have a concept of concept defense because elsewhere in the Torah, I can't remember exactly uh-huh. where, it says you, know, you will not depart to the right or the left. Right. You're not supposed to go beyond what the God said you're supposed to do. Right. Yet here, Adam went in the midst of them. Right. Okay, he went beyond it, and it, I mean, to me, it seems like almost they could have interpreted it like that was the fault. It was Adam's fault, clearly, for going beyond, for leading Eve into a situation where she right. Was well, I think wrong. right. I think that's I think that's the root reading of Avodah Rabbi Natan A. Um, is that the fence was um, uh, was the problem? But it's put in, in that's but it's put in God's words, which is where it is. Right in the parable. In the parable. Yeah. Yes. But, but I, again, I kind of want to underscore that, uh, and I'm glad you brought up sort of the, Deuter, the, sort of the Deuteronomistic uh, uh, theology of, you know, you should not stray to the left or the right, but there are all these things that the rabbis add, you know, to, you know. There's that joke uh, about kashrut, um, where um, God says, you should not spoil a kid in his mother's milk, and Moses says, does that mean I need two sets of dishes? And then God says, no, don't boil a kid in his mother's milk. And then Moses says, does that mean I need to search all the supermarkets for all of these, these certifications, these hectares? And then God says, fine, have it your way. Right? So um, uh, the rabbis don't see their prohibition, their extra prohibitions as adding to the law. Um, they see it as, um, as making the law more clear and the violation of it less possible. But um, the rabbis throughout acknowledge that, like for example, all of Shabbat law hangs, they say it hangs on a, like a whole mountain hangs on a thread. Right. Well, that's what's so remarkable about, about this, is that the, the CI is supposed to protect rabbinic thought, and yet here the CI is the opening to the transgressions, the exact action of what a CI is supposed to be. Right. So, so that implicitly threatens the entire rabbinic enterprise. Yes. Did later commentators try to undo that and, and bury that? Um, I, you know, I, I kind of joke that for me anything past the 10th century is postmodern. <laughs> so, um, so I haven't really spent a lot of a lot of time in the in the reception like post Gaelic period of this material, but um, one of the, the period, yeah, but right or what do you know? What do the you know what do the sort of the commentators do with it? Um, both my advisor and I are very fond of this particular. Um, this teaching because uh, it's a little bit editorial, like the way the Jewish like law progresses, it's like more and more strictures, more and more chumraot, um, and this is like saying no, all of the chumras that you keep adding, all of the strictures you keep adding the law actually are stumbling block. So I want to like lift this this uh, text up as a as a uh, as a uh, a banner for being more lenient in Jewish practice. So. Um, yeah, I just wanted to come back. I was interested in, <clears throat> you just said very briefly, uh-huh. um, so for the master Adam, the uh-huh. Rabbi yeah. Adam, um, can you talk a little bit more how that might work in that larger framework that you were talking about, of rupture even, uh-huh. and how, I mean, if it is traceable, when it's there, when it isn't there, and how that is to be understood. For me, I feel like it's a bit of a throwaway line, and that's why, like when I translated, I put it into parentheses. I think.